So good morning. Today uh, we're going to do uh, some talking about pretty much everything. True crime. Flipping through the news this morning. Seen a couple of things I wanted to address. Going to talk about uh, some questions that you guys had regarding uh, Idaho, regarding ASOC, and uh, an FBI agent making some claims boy in the box we got a lot of stuff to go over in 30 minutes so let's start off first with pantera right you see my shirt what's the deal this is the deal there's a reunion going on right well pantera got back together but is it really pantera without uh the two founding brothers uh i don't know everybody has the right you know to carry on Phil and Samo, Rex Brown, the two surviving members of Pantera. Hey, they got two great replacements to fill in for those two, but uh, it would never be the same. But they have every right. Remember when Leonard Skinner had their plane crash? And, you know, obviously Ronnie Van Zant, the lead singer, uh, died, and Steve Gaines, the guitarist, and Cassie Gaines, and Dean Kilpatrick. But 10 years later, the rest of the band got back together and then it's kind of stayed together with only one founding member Gary Rossington remaining in the band all these years later and they got Johnny Van Zant Ronnie's brother to uh to front the band just never the same and it's more like a tribute band but they carry on with the name Leonard Skinner and Gary Rossington was one of the founding members so I mean they have every right to do that you know it just ain't the same Pantera sent me some free tickets and said, hey, we're going to be at the uh, Bryce Jordan Center in State College, Pennsylvania. Once you want to hear us, I'd go. I'm not going to pay, but then again, I don't really pay to go see a lot of bands because I just don't like all the people. Like I said, if there's a party, for the most part, I'm the guy in the corner, you know, observing everybody, obviously with my back against the wall. That's just me. All right, that's music talk. For this morning, let's get into the first thing. Uh, yesterday we talked about the manner of death versus uh, cause of death. We sort of straightened that out. We're not sure what the dad means, and we don't want to speculate too much on that, right? We'll wait to see what comes out, and maybe that could have been, you know, what he meant by, well, not he meant, but police meant by targeting. I'm not going to get into that again because... I've gone through targeting and in this case too much. You have to go back and look at past episodes. But there is an FBI agent and or a former FBI agent, I guess, who's made some claims that the father who is giving this information of one of the Idaho victims, um, he's I I didn't read it. I searched for it. I got a couple comments about he's blaming the father uh, for the killings. Now, I hope I misread that. I, I hope I misread that. I hope that whoever sent me that is misinformed. And hopefully he's blaming maybe the father for not allowing police uh, to do their job. Because that's the only thing I could see. But I went into the father's frustration yesterday and how I understand that. Um, I don't understand why he wants certain things let out into the public, but if he feels, hey, this isn't working, whatever you're doing right now, uh, release this stuff so maybe something else can come in. Hey, I get that frustration. I don't agree with uh, doing that, but I, I understand. Now, if this former FBI agent is saying that they should be looking at the father for this murder, um, I don't know what words I have for that. If he truly said that, other than uh, despicable, maybe. Maybe it's somebody who's trying to push their own narrative. I mean, I, 
I don't know this guy. Listen, just because, and this is very important, just because somebody's an uh, ex-FBI agent or a current FBI agent does not make them a good investigator. It doesn't even make them a good person. Everybody is different. Just as because I'm a, a former detective, a, well, I won't say a former detective. It's just like a Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine. I feel once a detective, always a detective. But former law enforcement, um, you, you shouldn't trust everything I say. Just because of a title that I held in the past, you have to look at each individual person as an individual and on their merits, their character, their integrity. That's how you can believe and start listening to what people have to say. I think of the guy who worked the same position I did, I think. I was with the FBI task force for two, three years. I worked undercover, but it was Violent Streets Task Force. So I was assigned to the FBI. Okay, I was a, a local police officer assigned to the FBI. That's what I did. Now, I think this Cameron guy who did the show, Eddie Edwards, it was him or something like that. It was the most ridiculous show I've ever think I've seen in my entire life where they said Eddie Edwards, where he believed this FBI task force former detective that Eddie Edwards was responsible for John Benet Ramsey killing uh, the Atlanta Child Murders, Lacey Peterson, The Black Dahlia, O.J. Simpson, wife Nicole, all of these cases. It was the most asinine thing I've ever heard of. And I felt so bad for him. At the beginning, I wanted to be angry at him. But then I thought, if this is what he really believes, and he's making these connections. Remember, you can make connections to anything. You, that's why you have so many Zodiac suspects. Because everybody can place something with somebody or a crime. It's not hard to do. So just because he was a former detective, worked in FBI task force, you shouldn't just believe him. Okay? I think it was, it was the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. And go back and watch my video on it. It's called uh, Eddie Edwards, I think. Yes, Eddie Edwards was a murderer, and he might have been a serial killer, but he's not responsible for every infamous crime from the Black Dahlia all the way up to John Benet Ramsey, and then some. It's, it's ludicrous, and people like that shouldn't even get their 15 minutes. But hopefully that's all he got, and hopefully if this FBI agent, former FBI agent, is selling this to the news, I mean, I know his name because he was quoted in the same news article that I was for, I believe, Newsweek or Fox News. I'm not sure which one it was. Um, but as I was reading the article, his name was in there. And it didn't mention this. It was talking about hair follicles or fingerprints being destroyed by cold weather, which I think is, is ludicrous too. And, and that's another thing is these experts, they, they need to stay in their lane, bro. You know what I mean? If you don't know what you're talking about, and because the news reaches out to you just because you have a website or you have a title and you're selling a book, and they start asking you questions that you're not an expert in, don't, don't do it. You make yourself look like a fool. Good example is Newsweek reached out to me yesterday or the day before. Um, and asked me to comment on some power plant where these guys broke in with a gun or whatever. And I don't even, it was in North Carolina or something. And he asked me to give my opinion on it. I was like, yo, I, I, I have no idea. I don't know. I know nothing about it. It's not my area of expertise. Um, I'm not going to comment on it. Now, there's other people who would have jumped all over that. Oh, shit, Newsweek getting hold of me. That might be my launching point or whatever it is. Listen, just stay in your lane if you don't know. You know what I mean? Now, maybe you think you know. You know, then that's fine. You put it out there. People will, will obviously find out for themselves whether you're credible or not. But if this guy is saying that the father is responsible for his daughter's and three roommates death uh, unless he really believes it and even so if he does he would probably need his head examined but 
that just shows you that, you know, just because you're an FBI or former FBI agent doesn't mean you know anything. So, that's what I think about that. Uh, got a message or a comment today that on Delphi that Richard Allen was released on bail. Now, much like anything, when you hear something and it does something in your stomach, you know, it raises something, you need to investigate it further. I mean, because I thought this is ludicrous, so I actually spent 30 seconds researching it and found out that it wasn't true because I thought, this is ridiculous if this is the case. I researched it, I didn't find anything, and I'm like, oh, it's what I thought, you know, somebody spreading misinformation. The internet is so good for that, right? Uh, you post it and then people will believe it, share it, whatever you do, like it. So, no, it's not true. So if somebody reads that, that is not true. Um, I went on a little rant and I apologize for that last night. I, I turned down an interview. So... The booking agent got a hold of me and asked if I'd be interested in going on this Fox News show. American Reports, I think it was. I never heard of it. But that's not unusual. I just don't watch the news. And we went back and forth a little bit. I asked, hey, first, what kind of format is it? Um, you know, how much time do I have to speak? And she said, well, five minutes. And I thought it over for... Oh, probably 45 seconds. And I was like, no, didn't I not just learn my lesson on News Nation? So, you know, I, I don't need that. I don't need to go in there. Now there's some people that want to say, oh, you just missed out on a million viewers seeing you and public, uh, you know, getting your name out there. Hey, listen, my name's already out there. I've already been seen by over a million people. Okay. I don't, I don't need that anymore, and I'm not going to go through the hassle of starting to talk about a subject and then get cut off, get interrupted, not allow me to finish my train of thought. Now, somebody on my comments said I'm a prima donna. <laughs> well, oh well, if I am, I am. I think most people would beg to differ with your comment, uh, but... That's just the way I do things. You ever notice the older that you get in life, you just do what you want. You don't really care about other people's opinion. I've reached that stage in my life. I always equate like doing television shows, okay? I've been approached to do a lot of television shows, not interviews, television shows. Uh, especially after the Zodiac, but even before that Zodiac show. And... I pick and choose. I set my my boundaries. Hey, this is what I want, this and that. If you can't meet it, then I'm not doing it. It's not being a prima donna. It's just, listen, I equate it to Jim Morrison going on the Ed Sullivan show. And they wanted him to change one of his lyrics. He said, yeah, sure. And then when they went out there and did it live, he sang it his way. They got back. They started yelling at the band. You promise all this. You'll never work on Ed Sullivan again. And Jim Morrison said, I already did it. That's how I feel about all of this television, interviews. Hey, I've already done it. Okay? I don't need it anymore. I just, I want to do my own thing. So, that little rant I do apologize for because I'm not normally like that. I never use social media to put out my opinions I just used it to promote maybe the show or cold cases in general. But I find myself just sometimes getting angry at the lack of morals, the way society is going. But I am sure that my parents felt that about my generation and their parents about that, their generation. So I, I try not to get caught up in that. And I apologize for the rant that I had put on my Facebook page. Um, Instagram and YouTube so I'm gonna refrain from doing that uh, just because it's not it's not me 
uh, I do have anger and I do have issues, but I should not put them out on social media. So that's my rant on that. Uh, I had a question about ASOC, my organization. They said, hey, you talk about it in the past tense. What happened? Is it still functioning? Yes and no. So for you that don't know, I started an organization in, I think, 2013. It was, wow, it's almost 10 years. It's hard to believe. To help investigators and families with cold cases. And it got started. Um, I, I attended a VDOC Society conference. I think before that I had gotten in touch with Richard Walter. That's what it was. Went to his house. I had a case. I got stuck on it. It was my second cold case. I uh, couldn't figure it out. I'm looking for help. He was a profiler. He was from my area in Pennsylvania, a couple hours away. I went and met him at his house. He was very, very gracious. We went over some things. He invited me because he's the founder of VDOC Society. I went to a conference. They were presenting some cases. I'm in the back with every question, every answer they got that they threw out there. So at the end of it, I remember going up and, you know, shaking Richard Walter's hand and saying, hey, thanks for inviting me and all this. And two of the case presenters were like, oh, you're that dude that was in the back with all the uh, questions and answers. I was like, yep, that's me. And I always remember one of them was there was a, a murder, an unsolved murder, missing person. They found the body and it was wrapped her hands or something was wrapped in masking tape, not duct tape, masking tape. And they had a suspect and his car they towed and it had, he had used masking tape on the, to hide the license plate. But the masking tape somehow didn't match or something like the terrors didn't match or something to that effect. And I'm looking around at everybody in the audience. I'm like, are you, are you kidding me? Hey, hey, hey. Yes, you in the back. I'm like, that's your guy? Okay, I don't care. It's masking tape. It ain't duct tape that everybody uses. It's masking tape. He's a suspect. It's on his license. I don't care if the tape doesn't match. He's your guy. And it was around that time when I realized, okay, maybe, maybe I need to start doing more. So anyhow, fast forward, um, Richard Walter, very gracious, and we had talked about me becoming a member of VDOC, but they said, he said they only let in so many people, somebody has to die, it was uh, VDOC's age is the membership number, something like that. And re remember, I'm a young detective at this time with only nine years under my belt or something like that, and so... And that didn't happen. And I'm still stuck on my case. I went to the FBI's behavioral unit. They were very gracious. They gave a profile. But it just didn't seem to match. And I got frustrated and I said, you know what? I'm going to start my own organization. And I'm going to get the best of the best. And we're going to review cold cases for detectives that get stumped. Because that's what happened to me. And it was a horrible feeling. So that's how ASOC got started. So I started sending out letters, phone calls. And it was, I'd research papers, newspapers. And I just, Cyril Weck, Henry Lee, Joe Kenda, Warner Spitz, Mary Ellen O'Toole, Bob Keppel, Joe Kennedy. I mean, the list goes on and on. I got FBI profilers. I got retired FBI pro And the whole thing is I wanted every case to be looked at at a different level. I wanted an FBI profiler to give his opinion. I wanted medical examiners to give their opinion. I wanted homicide detectives to give their opinion. I wanted academia to give their opinion. And it, it was great. It grew. We had conferences every year with guest speakers. It was a lot to take on. It really was. And we looked at many cases, and we don't solve the case, right? We give our suggestions. Hey, this is what needs to be done. You know, our forensic 
you know, DNA girl would look at it this way and give her opinion and we'd give it back. A lot of editing because you got to imagine you're probably getting in 30, 40 different opinions from different investigators on a case. And then you got to take all of those opinions and put them in a, a report. And you got to imagine not everybody's going to agree on things. And you got to kind of make that jive to give back to law enforcement. And it was a very tough undertaking. But we had it working. And we looked at plenty of cases. Did any of them get solved? I don't know. It wasn't up to us. We just do the suggestion. But did that for eight, nine years. And then I got burned out. And when I left the uh, district attorney's office, I got burned out at everything. And I just didn't want to do investigations. I just decided, you know what? I'm going to become a caretaker of a couple farms. You know, elderly people need help. I'm going to go help them so they don't have to get up in the morning, lift their bales of hay, fix their fences, mow their yard. I'm going to do it for them. And that's what I did uh, for a year, maybe two years. And I had given the ASOC presidency to the vice president. You know, hey, do what you want. It's all yours. You know, I'm stepping back. Get a hold of me if you need anything. You know, I'll check in with you every now and again, but this is your, you run it. Very capable guy. Well, COVID hit. And a few years later, you know, I go to check in and he basically says, well, it's, it's basically defunct now. I'm like, what? He's like, well, we're not getting any participation and I have a full-time job. So do the other members. And well, I, I had a full-time job too, you know, but Hey, whatever happened, it, it fell apart. We had memberships, we had dues coming in, had all that stuff and it all went away. So needless to say, I was, I was pretty devastated and I was upset. This, this thing that I created kind of went downhill because I wasn't involved. And it just again showed my, my theory, my thought process on doing things. If you want something done, you got to do it yourself. I hate tasking stuff out to people. It seems like my whole life, you know, I try to do that and it always ends up in disappointment, mostly because they fail or it doesn't live up to my standards. When I had a private investigative business for a year and I had, you know, six to 10 people working under me, I got out of it because I was so frustrated. They would hand a report to me. I'm like, you need to do this. You need to do, why don't you do that? And I just, I was so stressed. So I, get, I quit doing it. I fired everybody and I just did it myself because that's the level that I want it at. So ASOC was kind of the same way. Met some great people at ASOC. I remember the first couple conferences sitting back and seeing just everybody talking about the cold case and giving suggestions to the law enforcement who's presenting their cold case. And I felt like a proud papa. I'd just sit there, lean back, and be like, yeah, I created this. Uh, met some, some great minds. Not even the famous people that you don't even know of. Bruce Harry, Bob Recker. I mean, there's, there's so many. Yeah, but just like any vocation, I ran into some assholes. Um, one guy who had written a book, and he was supposed to be this cold case guru, he threatened to sue me because we had a cold case journal, and he had written a paper that was co-authored by somebody. The co-author gave us permission to reuse it, and he didn't, and he didn't like me because of his own insecurities. I had a big go around with him. I bit my lip. Uh, people in my organization that I just did not like. They turned out to be, you know, what they truly were. And, you know, it's just like hey, ego. Ego was a huge thing for ASOC. Everybody wanted to be the best. Everybody wanted to, their, their theory was right. You know, so... It was a big undertaking, big undertaking. There's some people that, you know, I was fairly close to that I haven't talked to in years. 
um, because I see their true colors. Some of them just wanted the fame and the glory. One particular girl, that's all she wanted. She cared less about the work. And there was more like that. Um, but there are some guys that I will never speak to again. Remember, if I, you know, it's my flaw. If I feel uh, slighted, I'm out. You know, you're out. You know, and I felt disrespected by a couple people. But I got, when I left, man, I got a lot of love letters from members telling me, you know, Cyril Weck sent me something. It was so nice. I mean, but anyhow, the, I got it back. That's the important thing. Okay. After I stepped away for three years, it became defunct because of COVID and the leadership there. Well, yeah, okay. Well, give it back to me. And I am trying to revamp it. I don't know how I'm going to do it yet. I haven't decided. But there will be a revamping. It will not be the huge, you know, conglomerate that it was. This big entity where we're renting out huge ballrooms and buying everybody's plane tickets to come in as guest speakers. You know, it's not going to be like that anymore. It's going to be much smaller. But uh, I'm working on it. You know, I'm working on it. We'll make it work. So that was a long answer to the question about ASOC. I read in the paper this morning that Richard Cottingham, who was a serial killer, confessed to a couple more killings that they had him linked to. And I was glad to see that. It doesn't happen often. So when it does, I take notice because it's closure resolution for the families. So... Boy in the Box. I wanted to get to that. People have asked me if that was the case that I solved. Absolutely not. I do know of the case. I know VDOC Society had worked on that case in the past. So I'm hoping it's their organization that helped solve this case um, to give him a name. It was a big mystery here in Pennsylvania. I'm aware of it. I've never worked on the case, um, but I am aware of it. So congratulations to those detectives and investigators and civilians who helped in doing that and getting the name for that boy. I was contacted by uh, a mother of a missing person. Lisa is the mother. The daughter is uh, Tiffany Witten. And she had contacted me asking me if I could help in uh, finding her daughter. Now, uh, I never tell a grieving family member no. You know, I obviously... Um, can help somehow, some way. And in this instance, is I'm going to put it out here on this channel, put it out on this episode. Uh, you know, Tiffany went missing on 9 13 13 from a Walmart in Marietta, Georgia. She had, I believe, been had some sort of confrontation with the loss prevention officers that night and broke free from them, ran out of the store. Her boyfriend was with her. He is, you know, I, I'm not going to say he's a suspect, but from what I researched, it appears that he's certainly a person of interest, and every boyfriend would be. Um, but in this case, she had a history of substance abuse problems and for leaving at times. So I wouldn't automatically jump on the, the uh, she was met foul play bandwagon. I think you would have to look more into her victimology from what I saw. There was a girl, and I just, my age, I can't remember. I used to have a memory like a steel trap, but maybe it was uh, Michelle Weddington, something like that on my channel. Scroll back down, you'll find where she went missing and then she showed up many years later, fine, living a, a life somewhere else. Yeah, that's somewhat unusual. But she had the same victimology as, as Tiffany did. So there's always hope that she didn't meet foul play. And hey, that, as a parent, you know, that's all you want. You wish that they would reach out to you. Um, but, you know, for whatever reason, sometimes they don't. So, you know, the picture of uh, Tiffany, and if you have any information of that, uh, call... Uh, the police in Marietta, Marietta, Georgia, and hopefully she can get some uh, resolution to her case. If you do have a missing person, and you know, if I can help out, 
or an unsolved homicide. Hey, I'm always available, not always, I shouldn't say that. I am available to be retained to consult on cases. I've been doing that for over 10 years. But sometimes, you know, I know that that's a, a hard financial burden to do. Point you in another direction, or maybe I'll just, uh, you know, be able to give her or him exposure on my channel. You know, keep it out there. That, that's, that's what it's about. Never forget, never give up. So... That's going to be it this time for uh, True Detective Talk. Until uh, tomorrow, hey, back in black, Ken Maines, Maines out.